What's up, Dr. Jeannie Cody? Hello, Dr. Pace. How are you today? I'm doing good, thanks. I'm excited to be here. I, it has it has not started a storm, but it looks like it's getting there. So, well, we have an exciting topic to talk about. Really? Today. We do. Do tell. So I thought we should spend some time talking about dun 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 PML. Oh, be still, my heart. Right. What is PML? What's it stand for? PML, progressive multifocal leukencephalopathy, which is a great example of doctors just coming up with words that make us sound smarter than we really are. Yep, that's why I call it PML. PML, but pretty less, good. less of a mouthful. But it, it is a, especially for, for a lot of physicians, especially for MS physicians, mm -hmm. something that we spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about. Yes. So let me start by telling you a story. This is one of my favorite cases ever. And there was a patient who got into a car accident and on the scene um, realized after the car accident occurred that she had lost vision on one side of the world. Mm. So both eyes couldn't see the right side. And this happens when there's something in the left visual area that doesn't belong. And when she was scanned, we saw this white weird thing spreading in her brain. Ooh. Weird thing spreading brain. Not, we don't want to hear those things no. together. And it took a while to make the diagnosis. It took, it took multiple spinal taps and a brain biopsy to finally prove that this was PML. Mm. It took a lot of work, but fortunately is not something that we have to pursue at all very often. Her, she's doing better. She got through it. She never regained vision out of that side, but had also lost some strength that she regained very nicely. So out of curiosity, because starting with a bad car accident is yep. not the usual. No, nope. you know, nope. This is PML. Story. Was it something about the vision that led to the car accident? Wh well, she had never been documented to have been missing vision okay. and, and basically merged into another car. And just missed, didn't even know that they were there. And it, that change had not been known, and that led to further neurologic workup. So she, w she was unable to see on the right side of the world, but was unaware of it? But had no clue that she was missing or had a visual field defect. Had no clue that her vision of the world was shrinking down in size as something was spreading through her brain. I, it's, this is a horrible story, but also, isn't the brain so cool? So cool. So cool. So I... Yes. You know, it's complicated, but it plays by rules. Yeah. And if you take a good history and you listen to the clues, it, it is figure outable at the end of the day. So with your patient, how, mm -hmm. how was it that she came to have this very rare, strange thing? So she was on an MS medication called Tysabri okay. and had been on it a very long time, known to carry the virus that causes PML. And that virus is called the JC virus. John Cunningham. Now, initially when all this happened, she wasn't my patient yet. And they sent her home and said, we don't know what this is. And they sent her over to me, and I'm like, you have PML. <laughs> and the taps came back negative, and I said, you have PML. And the tap came back negative, and eventually the brain biopsy eventually verified PML. To me, there was literally nothing else this could be. You just need to be on the scene for accidents. you got to start doing routes with the ambulances. <laughs> that would solve a lot of problems. But... Um, you know, it's a, it's a really striking example of how this disease can really start so quietly but cause such a big impact. So, um, if anyone's ever seen a television commercial for a multiple sclerosis treatment, you've probably seen something like this. There's about 15 seconds to 30 seconds of people that are doing yoga on a beach at sunset Riding horses. Riding horses, having a having a fancy meal with mm -hmm. their family on a mountaintop for some reason. Doing something that anybody else would love to be doing at that moment. And then it goes from that to two and a half minutes of insane possible side effects. This could cause your arm to fall off. This could cause you to have headaches and nausea and diarrhea and vomiting. But... With MS, what they often will say is this medication could put you at risk for a fatal brain infection. And most of my patients, that's when they check out. They say, yep. nope, 
fatal brain infection? No, thank you. And they're horrified you even mentioned it. Like, yes. how could you do that to them? PML, that is that brain infection. Yes. And the reason the reason that it comes up with medications for MS is that it is the, some of the med or some of the medications are some of the, the things that increase people's risk the highest. PML is something that's incredibly rare. It can actually happen to anybody, mm-hmm. but it's you're more likely to be struck by lightning. And I've actually seen more cases in non-MS patients than I have MS patients. And really? that was yep, through residency. Um, on the bone marrow transplant service, Uh, you know, so I actually saw more in the cancer wards than I ever have seen in my MS patients. Interesting. So as much as we talk about it in the MS community, if you look at the global numbers, they're not near as high as you would expect for something that's been known for more than 15 years. So HIV Mm -hmm. is where PML really started to come out. And when HIV started to become um, more of a uh, epidemic, um, PML cases were were popping up all the time, and it, it is highly tied to how well someone's immune system is functioning. Yep. So um, maybe maybe we back up a little bit about the JC virus and how people get it to start with. John Cunningham. Trivia night. That's your answer. I know it's the only trivia question I ever get right. But, but so the the John Cunningham virus, not the Genie Cody virus, but someday I might find one to name after myself. You never want to be named. You would never want a virus name for you. Uh, true. Um, but yeah, so the John Cunningham virus or the JC virus. So this is something that actually is something you pick up as a kid. It's, it's sort of an asymptomatic infection that gets passed around. You might have some cold symptoms, but it's one of those types of viruses that once you have it, it sleeps dormant inside you, controlled, but, but sort of tucked away in different organs. And it may be there your whole life and you'll never know. Lots of viruses do that, actually. Yes. So yeah, this is not the only one. There are many viruses that you get exposed to, some viruses that never cause any symptoms mm-hmm. and that live in your body. Yep. And they think, don't cause any problems. I think shingles is a good example of a reactivation of a virus. Shingle. I think people are very familiar with shingles. Exactly. So viruses that live in your body usually remain dormant, but there are times where they can become uh, symptomatic or cause problems. And those problems can range from what people get with shingles, which is a miserable thing to go through, to something like PML, which Mm -hmm. is oftentimes fatal. And I think in in our world, we really first started to see an issue with this with Tysabri, and that is also called natalizumab. It's a drug that's been out a very long time for MS. It's a monthly infusion treatment. I think we didn't necessarily see that coming, and once we learned PML could occur... And really, it's very unique with how Tysabri works that it's such a potential issue with Tysabri. Because, you know, certainly not all drugs, that risk is not equal. And there's something really unique about the way Tysabri works that just makes that risk a little bit more likely. The the thing that Tysabri has in common with things like HIV or bone marrow transplant is that that leads to some impairment of your immune system, some sort of suppression or or modulation of your immune system and your immune system is incredibly complex mm-hmm. we, we talk a lot about if someone is immunosuppressed or if they're they've got problems with their immune system but think about your immune system like you would think about the defense say for the country or the world or whatever there's a lot of layers to that mm-hmm. there are armies and navies and air forces doing one thing there are police officers doing a different thing. There's security guards doing a different thing. So there's lots of things that are playing roles, lots of different cells in your body that have different jobs. And there aren't a lot of things that will deplete all of them. Mm-hmm. But certain ones are more necessary for certain things. And it turns out that one of the loopholes with this drug, natalizumab or Tysabri, which is usually a very, very safe treatment, yep. is that... It, it makes it so that your immune system has a little bit less access to your brain. Mm-hmm. And in the case of a condition that in some rare instances can go to your brain, if your immune cells are not surveilling your brain and, and keeping an eye on things, then it can go into something like PML. And the way I sort of explain it to patients is imagine, so, so with the JC virus, one of the places it can rest is in the brain, not causing problems. But I, I say, imagine you left the house for a weekend and you left kids at home, and generally the kids are well-behaved, but if you leave them gone long enough, one of them might cause a problem. 
one might start to act differently, act up, and cause damage. And with the parents not being able to babysit or watch the house, it creates sort of that perfect storm to allow something like PML to occur. That analogy hits uncomfortably close to home. Right? I like that one. I have so many kid analogies. Always about the kid causing some trouble. But yeah, um, but yeah so that's, you know, and that mechanism is unique to Tysabri. So really when we think about how these different drugs work and how they impair the immune system or those lines of defenses, they're not all equal. And I think it makes sense intuitively when you think of the mechanism, why that could be an issue with Tysabri. But the nice thing is along the way, we've now found ways to really modulate or reduce that risk. Yeah, the, the, the JC virus and, and viruses in general are things that we're pretty good at detecting if you've mm-hmm. ever been exposed to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can test to see if you've ever been exposed to the JC virus. We can test JC virus antibodies. Yep. Whenever you're exposed to something, or not whenever, but in most cases, your body will develop antibodies of that thing, and you you can test those fairly easily and figure out if someone's ever been exposed to a thing. Mm -hmm. So when we treat patients with multiple sclerosis, one of the tests we will always get to start with is a JC virus antibody test. Mm -hmm. It tells us if they are at risk with certain treatments like natalizumab um, or if it's something that they can do safely. Yep. And I don't know that that in the past was really standard of care because I can remember in training having patients that were not aware of their JC virus yeah. status, but now it's it's very just routine. And even if someone's on a drug where there's a risk, like they're on Tysabri, we monitor that more than once. We keep track of that over time to see is their risk changing. Yeah, the, the, the risk of having, JC, having been exposed to the JC in the U.S. is about 50-50. Yep. And if you have been exposed to JC, it's just living in your body, not doing anything, um, then over time that can put you at risk for PML. And it's because the reason it's over time is because the normal JC virus that floats around doesn't mm-hmm. cause PML. Right. It is a mutated form of the virus that does that. And in order for there to be a chance of getting the mutations that lead to PML, the virus has to go through a lot of life cycles. It yep. has to live and it takes time. It takes time. So, um, so we know that if people are negative for the virus to start off, mm-hmm. if they have not been exposed to it, then you have 50% that has never seen that virus and they're on a medication for that could put them at risk. They're really in the driver's seat because it takes years of time yep. of having both of those things in your system, the JC virus and whatever medication we're yep. talking about to make that risk actually start to, it never gets high, but it, it start to get to the point where we become uncomfortable. So, we test it every three months, six months, something yep. like that. And as yep. long as we stay ahead of it and know if people have ever been exposed to it, we can easily safely get people from one treatment to another. And I will say this isn't a test that I necessarily require for all MS treatments. I really use this when I'm assessing risk of Tysabri. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really use it outside of other settings. Because truthfully, if somebody was JC virus positive on Tysabri, you would pivot to a different MS drug to reduce that risk. You wouldn't necessarily use JC status to then decide risk for that drug. Right. I love Tysabri. I put my mom on Tysabri. So, you know, when we talk about the threat of PML, uh, you know, this MS doc is comfortable enough with how we can monitor for it that for her mom, you know, that was the right choice. Yeah. The the commercial thing is a big deal because... Oh, Totally. Once some people see that, it, it becomes, you know, terrifying. And yeah. when in, when we can, in reality, talk through the realistic risk of these things, yep. talk about why this risk has come up and the fact that it isn't as scary as it might seem. And we talked about how with my case, we required spinal tap and eventually brain biopsy to diagnose. But once, once it's diagnosed, tell me, Rob, about your approach to treating that. It's treating PML? Yeah, treating PML. So... PML doesn't have a treatment, so there isn't any, there isn't a viral, antiviral treatment that gets rid of the virus itself. So the first thing that we do is get rid of the thing that we think increases your risk. Yep. So if it's a medication that is suppressing some part of your immune system, we want to get that medication out of your system mm-hmm. so that your immune system can build itself back up and start to naturally fight the virus. Yeah, let the parents come home and clean house. Let the parents come home and clean house. Um, but uh, that also has a risk. Yes. If you are holding back the flood of your immune system with a medication, 
and you pull that medication away, there is a risk that you can get something called iris. Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, correct? Yeah, I was, I was hoping that you were going to say that because I couldn't remember the second I for a second. Yeah, trivia night. Trivia night. That's the other one. Yeah, to remember. you're right. Mm-hmm. So immune <laughs> reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Your immune system has been held at bay for a while. It, it goes back online and causes some havoc. And that can actually worsen people's symptoms immediately. Yep. And be... Uh, uh, Although it may have a survival benefit, right? I mean, you want your immune system taking charge and and really controlling that virus. You need it to shut it down. Yeah. It, it's no doubt that when someone's dealing with PML, they're, it's a rough situation. Yeah. Because you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yep. And we can use, with certain treatments, we can use means to get the medication out of their system quicker. Mm-hmm. So with natalizumab or tisabri, we can, we can do plasma exchange and suck it out of their system. But doing that might increase your risk of iris. Yep. Not doing that can mean that the PML has longer time to do what it does. There isn't a standardized treatment for PML. It's fortunately something that doesn't happen frequently enough to have a lot of data on it. Exactly. For as much as it's talked about, it is so rare we don't have a great, you know, gold standard treatment approach. Although I, I am encouraged because one of the good things, if you can call it a good thing, of having a, a complication from a treatment that becomes sort of in the public eye is that that makes more and more resources dedicated to trying yeah. to solve that problem. And things like vaccines for the JC virus mm-hmm. would never have been worked on because the JC virus is just one of thousands and thousands or millions of viruses that are floating around the world. But when we recognize that it could go on to cause such a problematic thing, mm-hmm. there's a way to head that off at the pass, that's very promising. That, that could be a game changer. Yeah. And certainly, re- I think, reduce patients' fears. Although, at, again, at the end of the day, that risk is very tiny for as much as it gets advertising attention. It is. You are more likely to be uh, killed by getting bit by a dog. I only know that because I looked at the CDC's odds of death page at mm-hmm. some point recently. and Some light reading? Some light reading and death by dog is slightly higher than your risk of PML. But uh, I think I think that's a good uh, way to kind of weight that in your mind, though. Also a good way to be afraid of dogs. Maybe another topic. <laughs> we'll do that next time. Rob, always good to talk to you. It, it is a pleasure, Dr. Jeannie. And we'll chat next time. Bye-bye.